we will, um, we, you know, the thing about being a public official is we present to one or two or two million, and it's all just as important. And so we appreciate you for taking the time to hear and participate in this community conversation. I'm Andrea Bearfield. I am the city council representative for District 1. Um, and we are glad to be here in the Multipurpose Center on the historic Quinn campus. And thank you to all of our staff members who have done just an amazing job of putting this together. This evening, um, I'm real excited to have an opportunity to, to, to share space and time with our newly elected Waco ISD trustees, Trustee Keith Guillory and Trustee Jeremy Davis. Um, who have been doing a, a gangbuster job of getting, you know, getting elected, getting sworn in, and getting their feet dirty. Um, because one of the things that we always know is that the, the, the campaign and the election is but the first part. <laughs> when you go behind the veil and realize what all actually happens in the moving parts is when you can really determine who and what your position will lead and who it will be. So I'm really excited to watch these gentlemen evolve and, and, and lay their passions down for Waco ISD and, and collaborate with the other institutions and entities within our city and community and county so that we can all work together for the better of Waco, yeah? Okay, y'all, I'm Baptist. I do call and response, so you're gonna have to, I have to know that you're with me. Um, <laughs> so, um, we will not be long with your time, but I know that there's so many things going on right now with um, the uptick of our COVID numbers, with, um, you know, uh, decisions to do, to, to have a bond. Uh, with buying buildings and things. There's so many things going on. So we wanted to give an opportunity for you to hear from us, number one, um, and give us an opportunity to hear from you, number two. But we, with the caveat, we know there's six meet the teacher nights tonight. And that's hard, you know, because how can we be in multiple, multiple places at one time? But those of you who are here who are not paid to be, God bless you. Um, <laughs> I need you to do something for me. Take the information and share it, okay? You know, what you get from here, you know, when you get in, in, the, in the group or get at the church or get at the barbershop or get at the restaurants or get with the people and the family on the chat, let them know what happened here tonight so that then we can continue to keep this conversation moving. Is that fair? Yes. All right. Um, okay, so I am going to yield right now to Trustee Guillory and the other parts of the evening. Absolutely, and, and thank you um, for those kind words. And yeah, we, we did get elected back in May and we did have to hit the ground running because yeah, as soon as we um, got on the school board, you know, that was the avalanche of things um, coming our way from um, COVID-19 to which we're gonna have um, some speakers here tonight speaking on with um, Dr. Kelly Reynolds and Dr. Chris Houston. Appreciate you all being here. And you know, also the school bond, and that's what we're here to, um, tonight to talk about. We want to explain uh, what a bond is, and also um, kind of dive into um, our last meeting that we had. A lot of parents and and, and students um, had questions about COVID and had comments and statements about COVID. We received um, so many emails um, on the topic, and we want to make sure we heard the community, make sure that we um, responded. And um, from the time. Um, during the campaign, um, everyone heard me say that I would hold these type of forums um, to hear the community, to speak to the community. And I'm one who believes that um, information um, to the community should be a push. We should be constantly pushing information to our parents and to our students and, and to our community. You shouldn't constantly have to go out and try to pull the information from us and try to seek and look for the information. So the information you're receiving tonight um, from from our community clinics, from our doctors, um, from our trustees, um, from the school board, and also uh, council members. This is, an, this is an opportunity for us to, to partner together as a city and as a district and give um, information to the community. And that's what it really should, should look like. We should come together and uh, host things like this and let our community you know, hear from us and also us hear from our community. So uh, I want to go ahead and I don't want to take too much time. I want to pass it over to, to Trustee Davis so he can say some, some words and then bring up um, Dr. Reynolds and, and Dr. Chris Houston. 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Um, everything has already been said. We appreciate you guys for coming out uh, to receive this information. Very important. Um, I think one of the main priorities of me and Keith coming on the school board is we wanted to make sure it was a constant flow of information going out to the community and we were transparent as possible. So any questions that you may have, please ask them tonight. Um, if you think of something later, please feel free to reach out to us and we'll get you the answer. Thank you. Let's bring up um, Dr. Kelly Reynolds and, and Chris Houston, Waco Family Medicine. And we're just gonna kind of talk about where we are um, from, from the science uh, of, of what's going on and our uptake of COVID-19. So we appreciate Waco Family Medicine for always being a willing community partner and standing with us as we move forward in this fight. So, ladies. Thank you very much for having us. Appreciate you uh, uh, having us come and, and talk to y'all. Um, so, uh, I just wanted to, to, to start, um, this is an overview, you know, we always were, oh, I'm Dr. Kelly Reynolds, <laughs> and I'm the uh, Deputy Chief Medical Officer uh, at uh, Waco Family Medicine, been there for 16 years and been Chief Medical Officer uh, for about eight years. Uh, family medicine doc, my clinic's out in McGregor. So still see patients out there a couple of days a week. So, you know, for years we were family practice. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just so excited to talk about family medicine. And then we have our, um, Chris uh, Houston is our um, uh, uh, compliance and equity officer at Waco Family Medicine. Been here with us for uh, just about a year almost. No, and, no? I've got February 1st. Oh my goodness, it hasn't been that long at <laughs> all. So. so hard, it seems like a year. Yes, yes. So I am a native Houstonian, but um, my, my mother grew up right here in East Waco and has lived in Waco um, all of my adult life. So I have been coming to Waco for family gatherings forever. I used to be able to look out at this campus when my aunt was a student here and I was a little, like a, maybe one or two years old and I would be saying, I wanna go to school too. Um, but right across the street from here when Paul Quinn College was here. So it is a privilege and an honor to be here today to share a little bit of information about Waco Family Medicine and, and other uh, pressing things like this pandemic with you. So thank you all for your time and attention and the part you've been waiting for. <laughs> Actually, you go ahead and start with this. So um, some of you may be sitting there thinking, what is Waco Family Medicine? Because you know it is Family Health Center or Family Practice Center. In February, we changed the name so that all of the 15 clinics could be branded uniformly and so that no matter which of the clinics you come to, you would know that they are part of one uh, health center. And so we are now Waco, fa Waco Family Medicine. The people, the locations, and the care are the same though. We have not been sold or acquired or merged, and there are no changes to our prices or our billing. So we are still the same family health center, just with a new name. Um, Y'all let us know if you have any questions. Uh, holler out, raise your hand. Um, and so uh, uh, the Waco Family Medicine uh, group of, of, of uh, clinicians, they provide um, high quality, comprehensive primary and, and preventative health care that's medical, dental, behavioral health um, uh, across our 15 sites. And I did want to make a particular plug for, for mental health. I mean, our um, behavioral health is, uh, is uh, provided by a team that includes a PhD clinical psychologist, uh, some licensed clinical social workers who are integrated into the clinics, providing some behavioral health uh, to, to, with patients and teams, you know, right there when folks have their, their doctor's appointments. And then we've got a group of counselors um, that provide uh, mental health and behavioral health um, uh, counseling sessions on a scheduled basis. So we've got lots of different arms of our mental health um, and mental health care. Um, we have a question. Yes. Good question. So we um, we do take uh, we provide care regardless of, of ability to pay. Uh, we take, of course, Medicare, Medicaid, private insurance, and we have a group of eligibility specialists that help our uh, patients 
apply for different assistance programs. Um, so they will, they will help uh, 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 acquire funding and programs um, to cover services. And then for folks that don't have any, other, any of those options, um, we do have a, a, sliding, um, a sliding scale fee um, based on family size and income. Uh, you can um, qualify for it. It's our good health card. It's a, it basically, it's a discount for our services. And almost all of our patients that don't have other funding sources um, uh, qualify for, for major assistance from us. And that covers, again, both um, mental uh, health, behavioral health, medical, dental. Uh, den yes, dental, um, and uh, pharmacy services, lab, x-ray, uh, there's a whole variety of services that we provide there at, at Family Health Centers, uh, Waco Family Medicine. So that's a good question, good question. Um, and, uh, and then 90% of the McLennan County residents live within 10 miles of one of our clinics. Um, and then, well, already, you asked a great question because it, uh, it applied to the, to the rest of that slide. Any further questions on that? Yes. Yes, we try to find a clinic that's close to, to where you live or where you work. Uh, and certainly if you um, uh, move locations, we'll try to find you a new clinic. But it's not like school zones. You can pick your clinic. You can go to any one of the 15. Yes. yes. So let me tell you a little bit about some of the programs and services that we have, because we are trying to address social determinants of health. Our mission is to serve the vulnerable, to serve the, the underprivileged and the economically disadvantaged. And so um, those are the people who have the most health issues for uh, reasons that are probably very obvious to you. So some of the services that we have are a medical legal partnership. Right across the street from us is Greater Waco Legal Services, and they provide um, things like wills and estate planning services family law services, some immigration uh, law services, and that is a partnership that we have. Um, we are able to screen some of our clients' legal needs and then offer them a referral so that they can get care regardless, once again, of their ability to pay. Um, we also have produce prescriptions and exercise prescriptions. As you heard from Dr. Reynolds, preventive care is part of our mission, so staying healthy it, the, the old saying, um, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Mm -hmm. So some of the things that we do uh, for our patients are offer produce prescriptions. We have a partnership with the World Hunger Relief Fund, and we offer big boxes of organic, fresh-grown vegetables. The doctors will write produce prescriptions for some patients if their medical conditions uh, require, you know, an apple a day, keeps the doctor away, eat more vegetables, that sort of thing. So we actually do have produce prescriptions. We also have a gym that is at a restricted capacity uh, because of COVID, but we write exercise prescriptions. Mm -hmm. Same difference, you know, apples, exercise, same difference. Um, we have chronic care management uh, through our integrated health managers. These are basically psychotherapists that help um, with chronic care needs like diabetes, um, chronic heart disease. And then as you see today, we put a priority on partnering with our city and county leadership to address health related issues and to provide health literacy information to the community. I'll let you talk about that one too. So please join us. As Dr. Reynolds stated, this information may be for you or someone you know. One of the, one of the um, client, types of clients that we have that you might not think are entrepreneurs and small business owners and self-employed people because we do provide medical care uh, that is affordable. So we welcome you to get involved with what we're doing. Ask us later. There are a number of volunteer opportunities um, because we do want to connect with all of you in our neighborhoods to find out what you need and how we can meet your needs. We look forward to listening, educating, and learning alongside you. So we have a Facebook page that you can follow us on to see what we're doing. We had a health fair, for example, recently. Um, and come and see us if you need medical, dental, or mental health services. The number is there, and if you call that number, we can give you guidance on how to establish care, how to find a doctor, a dentist, a counselor, or whatever you need. Yeah.
Yeah, do you know anyone um, in, your, in your neighborhood or your family that doesn't have a medical home? We would, we would be glad to, to uh, establish care with you. Um, and then just a couple of uh, uh, points about um, COVID. Uh, we are doing our COVID evaluations, COVID care um, outside and under tents. Uh, and um, so for Waco Family Medicine um, uh, patients, the, the COVID visit and testing is, is free if, if you don't have any sort of coverage, free testing. And then um, we have a COVID vaccine clinic um, two days a week during on Tuesdays and Thursdays and then Saturday mornings. Um, and again, COVID vaccines, of course, are free as well for, uh, for our uh, Waco Family Medicine um, patients. Um, and then, of course, you, uh, to schedule you, either of these, just call your clinic or, or call our main number at 4200. I think that is it. What, what questions does the group have? Dr. Henry, do you think you need Yes. Yes, we are on most, I can't say 100% all, but we are on almost all um, health insurance plans as well. Yes. Did you guys hear the question? No. <laughs> I guess it doesn't. So one of the things that um, Trustee Guillory asked us to do was to provide a brief opportunity for you to ask us, but really her, <laughs> the medical doctor, um, any questions you have about COVID, about the vaccines, about the changes to the uh, CDC guidelines regarding vaccines and all of those things. So this is also an opportunity for you to pick our chief medical officer's brain about that. So please don't be shy. Right. I'll kick it off with the, with the question that was submitted um, on, on Thursday night. So when we're talking about uh, masks, and that's, that's kind of the... The, the polarizing um, topic that's out there, um, mask. And so can you kind of explain the importance of wearing a mask and then also who's protected in those relationships right there? The person that doesn't have a mask on and then you have a person who's wearing the mask. Because I know in my own household, uh, before COVID, if some, one of our kids or if I had the flu or my wife had the flu, we, uh, before COVID even happened, we would quarantine you to your room We'll put a mask on you around the house, and then, but no one, no one else in the house was wearing a mask. But we put that mask on the individual to keep those germs from spreading. So, as a person who's wearing a mask, I know I'm asking a lot of questions right here, but as a person who's wearing a mask, um, protected from the person who's not wearing a mask, I guess is, that's kind of the question I'm asking. Those are, are really good questions, and it is a it, it is a confusing thing sometimes to kind of keep straight. But the way I like to think about it is is my mask that I'm wearing is protecting you. Mm -hmm. And when you wear a mask, you're protecting me. Mm -hmm. um, and so the mask is really to catch all the little virus particles that are in our breath and in our cough and sneeze and, and, and everything, all, everything that comes out of us. Um, and so when we wear a mask, we're protecting all those around us. Okay. Um, and so that's a good question. Why, why would we wear uh, masks? Um, and I just wanted to show this one uh, uh, kind of a, a funny slide here. Um, this is a, a, a graph that looks at uh, uh, visits, day by day, visit counts for folks coming into Waco Family Medicine. So it's just our clinic system. Uh, coming into cl uh, uh, Waco Family Medicine clinic system with re viral kind of symptoms, sore throat, cough, fever, shortness of breath, um, you know, uh, those sorts of kind of either COVID or flu-like illnesses or what we call that. That's why it's called ILI and COVID-like illness. Um, and the green line is 2021. So we are, you know, right over here right now. Um, and it starts, you know, from the, from the far left is January, goes all the way through December. The red line was last year. So we had this big spike. In June, you guys probably remember of all the COVID cases, and it kind of petered out, died down a little bit, and then it spiked again in the winter. And then the blue line is the average kind of visits um, for, for viral illnesses for 2017, 2018, and 2019. So it kind of averaged the, the three years before COVID. And it kind of, you can kind of see that normally we have a lot more viral illness visits kind of in the, in the fall and winter when school starts and those sorts of things. 
Um, but again, looking at that big spike last uh, summer in red, um, before the, the, the uh, vi vaccine was available, um, you know, we're just kind of figuring things out. But looking at this green line now, you can see that we're, we're starting to shoot up again. Um, and in fact, right now we're having more uh, viral illnesses than we did last year, even before the, vi the vaccine was available. Um, so this is why we're, we're concerned, uh, is that we're having more episodes of um, folks with viruses. We're having more positive um, uh, tests, more folks diagnosed with COVID, and more folks in the hospital. Um, you know, the, you, uh, go to the, the uh, Waco COVID or the COVID Waco uh, website and look at the, the recent hospitalizations. And we're, we're concerned about that. So we're recommending that, that everybody go ahead and, and mask up when you're inside again, especially if you can't really social, social distance very well. Um, and one of the questions that, that has come up is, well, if I'm fully vaccinated, do I need to wear a mask? Um, and we are, we are doing our darndest to follow CDC recommendations. And right now the CDC is saying if you're in an area with high COVID transmission, high COVID incidence, which is all of Texas, but certainly is Waco, um, we are red on that, on that map. We're, we're red. Um, then they're, then they're recommended even fully vaccinated people um, go ahead and wear masks um, because we can still get the virus. We're less likely to get COVID. We still can get it. It's probably going to be a mild case. We're in, in very unlikely to end up in the hospital um, compared to someone who's, vac who's not vaccinated. So if we're fully vaccinated, we're very unlikely to get so sick that we have to be in the hospital and extremely unlikely to die from COVID. But we're still contagious. And I'm sorry, what was that? I think you said, when, when will the booster shot yes, be available? The, the CDC certainly, they, were, they are doing studies on going on that. And right now, the CDC is recommending, and I almost hate to call it a booster shot, because I think of a booster shot as like every 10 years you need a tetanus booster shot, right? This is, the, right now, they're just recommending a third dose for folks that they think their immune system is so bad, they probably didn't respond to the first two doses. And that's mainly patients who have had like uh, organ transplants, like kidney transplant, um, liver, or lung, liver or lung transplant, and then patients who are on chemotherapy for cancer. That they're being treated for cancer, their immune system is so bad right now that they probably didn't mount much of a, mount much of a response to the first two doses. So they say after about four weeks, you can get a third dose, really see if it will boost your response. They haven't come out with a recommendation for a third booster for anyone else or a third shot for anyone else yet. And you had a question. And you had a question. Go ahead. Yeah, my question is, so we got our guidelines for Waco ISD as educators for what was to happen as far as reporting or letting people know. And one of the things that it said was if you come into close contact with someone who's a known positive and you've been vaccinated, I have to say I'm concerned about this also, but I also understand that the school district has certain guidelines that they're following. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, to be honest, did not review all of the, the mandated guidelines from the governor's office or the is it TEA mm -hmm. and, and their guidelines. So I know that there are certain restrictions and guidance that the school districts are getting. I personally, as a doctor, am really worried about not quarantining if you, have a, if you have kids who are close contact, I would want them to quarantine. But then, um, again, I know there are different um, well, <clears throat> we saw, regulations. I'm sorry. We saw a lot of that during the beginning of COVID when we were trying to walk that line uh, with HIPAA and mm -hmm. giving out individuals uh, medical information and things like that. So I think maybe that's some of the thinking behind it. Is, maybe some you know, of the concern, yeah. possibly, yeah. 
So I, I think it's, it will, it'll be interesting to see how that progresses. Maybe, maybe recommendations will change. I'm not really mm -hmm. sure, but yeah, concerning. And you had a question. Yes, I have a daughter. Yeah, we have to talk to them. That, that is a good question, and that, that recommendation to get the shot during pregnancy was delayed because they were continuing to do studies and really looking at the safety of the, the vaccine um, during pregnancy. Um, and all the, the studies that they've done have shown that, that the vaccine is safe and effective. I always, I always put those two together. You want it to be safe and effective, um, but it is safe for pregnant women and for breastfeeding women too, well, folks that, that are, are nursing. Um, and the concern is that, that the, a COVID infection can definitely cause pregnancy complications. We've had um, uh, ladies that have ended up in the ICU on the ventilators and have, have died from COVID while they're pregnant. There, there's something about the COVID infection that actually uh, is more dangerous for pregnant women. So um, I would just say that the, the, the risk of complication from getting COVID while pregnant while pregnant is a, certainly a, a higher risk than any possible complication. And we don't know of any, any risks for getting the vaccine while they're pregnant. I was at a meeting um, at Baylor Scott and White Hillcrest last week with nurse leadership, nursing leadership. The labor and delivery nurse um, supervisor was there and so was the pediatrics nurse supervisor. That week, they put two pregnant women in ICU with COVID. Also last week, one of our doctors, Dr. Zachary Sarter, um, told me on Thursday that he had just admitted a two-week-old baby to the ICU. So this is serious, and, and I hope that you can convince her to get a vaccin vaccination. Yeah. I mean, however, however we proceed and move forward in this, you know, we're trying to get and do the best information and the best data that we can so that you can go about making the choices you need to make. At the end of the day, I think the, the biggest argument from the, um, the, the people who are against masking and against vaccinations is about freedom, right? Um, now, where, where our hands get tied is in what we can mandate and what I can say you have to do or you must not do. You know, if, if, if you were a person who in your role as a teacher knew that you had been exposed, I would hope. <laughs> I, I would hope. But I, you know, no one can say you must. Thank you. And I, and I appreciate that. Just because, you know. It is. That's kind of like, you know, that yellow light. That yellow light means yield and to slow down. Some people interpret that as green. Florid. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, it, you, know, you know, but what we're trying to do is to get as many people to, to get to an understanding of what that yellow means. The yellow means that we, you know, it's cautionary to take care. We've got to take care of each other as best we can. You know, we are incredibly proud to have our partners of Waco Family Medicine. And, and to be honest, thank you all for coming, but all of our health professional partners, whether it be Ascension Providence or Baylor Scott and White, that stand with us and, and have stood up vaccination clinics, have stood up testing facilities. Thank you to the um, Waco uh, McLennan County Health District for, you know, realigning our testing sites because we need them again. Our numbers are increasing. And so we've got to go back, you know, all hands on deck, much to the chagrin of those staff members who have been beaten up mercilessly for working basically 24 hours a day for 18 months. But we will do it because we've got to, you know, because if not a place to get a vaccine, a test, you know, right now, if you need a, a COVID test and it, because they'll be stood, are they stood up? When would they be stood up this weekend? Um, thank you. As, 
former former chief, current uh, assistant city manager, Hope. Um, uh, we're, we're getting those things back online, but the health district has uh, vaccina uh, vaccinations and tested COVID testing available. All you have to do is call and, and set up a time and go. You know, Waco Family Medicine has a testing facility and a vaccination facility. All you have to do is call and set up a time. And so there are, we don't have the excuses because, you know, while we may have, you know, we, when we thought it was safe to go, you know, go back in the water, we did. And, you know, we pulled the mass vaccination sites and things, but we may, hopefully, if we all get in agreement, we won't have to do that level again. But the fact that we can and that there are people who are at the ready to get it done is a good thing. And I, you know, extra thankful to, you know, you all and our staff. So one of the things that I would like to ask you to do um, is to talk to them about how the Delta variant and the two others, but mainly the Delta variant, has actually caused these changes. Because without understanding what it means for COVID to be mutating, for what it means for COVID to have all these variant forms, people are probably just thinking, what are the doctors and scientists doing? Why is the information conflicting? Right. Um, well, and certainly the, we, the Delta variant is concerning to all of us because it is so much more infectious and contagious. Um, the, I mean, the, 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 with, when someone is, is uh, sick or maybe they don't even have symptoms, but the amount of virus in their respiratory system is just so much higher um, that it's a, a significantly more uh, contagious. I mean, it's just more easier yeah. to, to sp uh, spread it, easier to spread it to a lot of people. Um, and then unfortunately, it's also more virulent, meaning it, it causes people to be sicker. Um, again, the vaccine is, is protecting folks. Yes, you can still get a mild case, but you're just not gonna go to the hospital or, or end up, end up uh, in the ICU or, or dying from it. Um, but there's, there's, unfortunately, there's plenty of other folks. Um, and right now, every ICU bed in, in Waco is, is full um, with patients. They're not all COVID patients, but um, of course, the concern we have it when we fill up our hospital with folks that have the Delta variant and are you know, in the ICU or just needing oxygen, those take up beds that other people that might have, you know, might have needed care for something. Um, so we, we just really trying to uh, to continue to to use our precautions, use the things that are easy to do, the, the masking and social distancing, um, and then and then really really encouraging folks to get vaccinated. Even though this is a variant, um, we still feel like the vaccine is important um, uh, to protect to protect folks from this this um, vaccine. And the more folks that continue to be from the virus from the virus, sorry, yes, yes. <laughs> Um, and, uh, uh, and, and the more folks that continue to, to hold out on getting the vaccine gives more kind of a, a kind of space and, and people for, to, for, to spread the virus and, and allows more mutations to continue to occur. Um, I, we had a town hall uh, at Waco Family Medicine a while, uh, just a couple weeks ago, and someone asked, well, is it the vaccine that's causing the variants? Kind of like taking too many antibiotics can cause resistant uh, bacteria. This is totally different. If we could all be vaccinated and stop the spread, that, that virus would, would not be mutating and, and spreading the new variants like it is. So the, the quicker we can all get vaccinated, the, the less variants we're gonna be facing. What, what's the best way to, for people if they have additional questions to reach out to you all? Cause we wanna make sure we get these fine questions answered. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. Do you want to? They can contact me. Okay. It's just not, there are not too many people here. Okay. So I, let me. I can pull it back up. It's okay. Right there. I didn't put it in there. Um, oh, you're, you're. Uh, I'm just going to type. On this. this is my contact information so that you can reach me if you have any questions and I will forward them to the doctors or whoever needs them. All right, uh, while, while they're putting it on the screen, I'm gonna go ahead and read some of our guidelines we've set as a district. Um, this you. was kind of put out last week during our meeting. Um, 
I will say that we do have a lot of things that can't be mandated that comes from the governor. We kind of have strict guidelines we have to follow. And I think uh, WISD has done a very good job of going to the line as much as we could. Uh, so uh, and we're gonna encourage the wearing of masks in all district buildings. We're gonna encourage employees and students to get vaccinated when eligible. We're gonna conduct contact tracing. We're gonna notify parents and guardians if their child is considered to be in close contact for a positive case of COVID-19. We're gonna notify uh, faculty and staff if they are considered to be in close contact with a positive case of COVID-19. We're gonna update the district's COVID-19 dashboard regularly. We're gonna to continue to use the rapid testing for students and staff. We're gonna provide uh, ass assignments to students who are unable to attend school after testing positive for COVID. Uh, and if parents or guardians opt for them to quarantine after being identified as close contact. So that's one of the things that's different from last year. Last year, you didn't have a choice. If you came into close contact with a student, you had to quarantine. This year, it's gonna be up to the parent if they wanna quarantine their child or not. Uh, monitor the attendance and achievement of students and adjust plans as needed. So that's gonna kind of be the district guidelines. Yes, ma'am. question about um, protections for the staff that um, routinely have to go under quarantine and things. Um, last year, there was an extra 10 days that was offered through the government to help offset that. Um, once we ran out of that, it was up to us to use our personal time. So without having this time built in from the government this year, is there any protection for teachers who are gonna be forced out because of Yes, ma'am, I appreciate that question. Um, as far as I know, that we don't have that extra 10 days built in this year. Uh, it's not a district decision, but as far as I know that as of right now, we don't have those 10 days built in like we had last year. So my personal message would be, everybody please get vaccinated when you can. Uh, we can't mandate that your kid wear a mask, but you can mandate that your kid wears a mask if that's the choice you wanna make. Uh, as staff members, you can wear a mask if you want to. We encourage it, we can't make anybody do it, but if, if that's something uh, we do feel strongly about, so we encourage you to wear your mask, we encourage you to get vaccinated and do your part to help the community. Hey, thank you, Trustee Davis. And I wanna thank um, Trustee uh, Stephanie Corderwig, I see you walked in, kind of snuck in on me. And thank you for, for being here tonight. And, and if, if anyone has any more questions on, the, um, on, the, on COVID-19, we'll try to answer those questions as well. But I want to shift gears uh, to the bond. Um, another reason why a lot of um, people are here tonight, um, we talked a lot about it in our last um, board meeting. And first, I always like to start off um, on what a bond is, um, because I know growing up, you know, a bond for me was um, something totally different than what you see um, when you're talking about a, a school bond. Um, so a bond, um, just, just putting it um, plainly, is um, a school district uh, doesn't have this big um, surplus of, of money like a, a lot of people um, believe. They believe we have this, um, this honey pot that we, can, that we can dip into anytime we need. Um, something purchased, like especially big purchases. If you want to do the HVAC system inside of a school, or if you want to build a new indoor practice facility, or if you want to build a, a new school, um, like what we're talking about doing now, building five different five new schools um, within our district, uh, there's no pot that you can that you can reach down into and grab that sum sum of money um, to to make those purchases or 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 to 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 build those um, facilities. And so what you, what you have to do is a lot like um, what a homeowner has to do when they want to build their home or purchase a home. You have to go and pull a loan uh, from a bank. And I don't want to get into the weeds talking about investors and them coming in and purchasing uh, the bonds. And, but ultimately, um, that loan, just like your mortgage, um, has to be paid back. Um, and so that's where the taxpayers um, come in, is, is where the taxpayers are the, are the individuals who are paying this bond back. And so this is why we put a bond forward um, to be voted on. And coming this May, we'll have a bond um, on the ballot. I'm sorry, yeah, November. November, we'll have, the, we'll have a bond on the ballot uh, to be voted up or voted down. And it's up to the individual taxpayers um, here, individual um, voters, to go in and vote for or against the present bond. 
And so when this um, last board meeting um, came about, uh, we all voted unanimously to uh, pass this um, bond and put this bond on the ballot for, uh, is it 355, 355 million. Uh, and Trustee Davis will break down all the numbers, but I'm gonna speak on the reason why, you know, I chose to vote yes on the bond. And that was, um, it was right down the street from here. It was Carver Middle School. You know, I was, I was there that night as along with a lot of other students and even teachers and, and principals and the dean for Carver showed up and Councilwoman um, Bearfield showed up and a lot of, a lot of individuals, ex-classmates. I talked to a, a guy today, Mr. Neal. He was um, the class of 1957 and he um, brought out his yearbook and was showing me pictures and of him at, at Carver. You know, Carver used to house um, first through um, 12th grade, I think it had around 500 students at the time that um, went through that school, and he was one of them. He was in the second class, and he showed me one of, actually one of the school board members, um, Mr. Cavill. He was a school board member at that time. He showed me pictures of him. So it's a lot of history there, and watching all of those individuals come through and, and speak about what that school meant to them. And, and I actually started my nonprofit um, in there, Lit Waco, where we went in. Um, Principal McAdoo was there. My wife and I in the back, we went in there and we used to read with the students in there. We had reading rallies and all these different things. So it was so much inside that school and to, and to watch it burn and, and, and sit as it does right now. You know, that night I had to vote yes um, for the bond to rebuild Carver Middle School. We need a new Carver Middle School, not one that was, um, you know, built um, like that, you know, the present one was, but we need a, a new, um, bigger um, Carver Middle School with the technology that our students need. And so that's, that's what I was looking at um, when I voted yes, we need a new Carver, and then we need a new Waco High as well. Um, if, you, if a person hasn't walked the halls of Carver Middle School and Waco High School, then you, you need to at least walk the halls of Waco High. You can't walk the halls of Carver anymore, but you can walk the halls of Waco High School. Um, we went there for the Family Fest this past weekend, and we went to universities first. My wife and I, my, my young daughter, she's at Lake at Montessori. And man, university, that school is amazing. All the technologies, well lit, wide hallways, individual spaces for study, um, the newest, greatest technology, culinary arts. They have um, a new mechanic um, shop back there where you can work on vehicles. It's the latest and greatest. And then you walk over to Waco High School. And we wonder why our students feel the way that they do, you know, when we um, see them walking around our neighborhoods. And so these are the things that went through my mind. When we went to, when we went to Waco High, they had the, the old lion head blown up, you know, in front of the school that the parents can walk under. It was barely standing. You know, we went through the hallways and they were so narrow that you couldn't hardly get through there with the tables and the parents walking through. The school was very dim, not well lit. Uh, we have leaks and, and, and air condition systems, HVAC systems not working. So these are the things that I thought about when I voted yes for this bond. And so this is why we've come in before the community and we're bringing the bond to you to vote on. And there will be a tax, a tax burden there. We'll break the numbers down. And it comes down, I think it comes out to about, what, 10, close to $10 a month or something like that um, for the family. And so I really want to give those reasons why, I want to give a reason why I told a council member once before, I said, hey, whenever you vote, be able to tell people why you voted that way. And so that's why I came here tonight, is to tell you why I voted that way. But at the same time, I want to hear from you and what you think, and also give you other options if you don't like this present bond and um, with the school district and also in, in the, in the school board can look at. So I'll pass it to, to Trustee Davis. Uh, just to give a little bit more background on kind of how we got to this point. So for about 10 months, we had a long range of planning facility meeting of about 80 people. So every, I think every other week or every two weeks, we got on a Zoom call and we were presented with all this information. So tours of each school, kind of uh, how it was compared to modernized schools, kind of what we had the budget for, how much it would cost to re renovate the schools, how much it would cost to build a new school. And at the end of that long process, it was a, it was a process that I got to be a part of before I was on the board. Uh, 
the top five priorities were Waco High was number one to build a new Waco High. Uh, the number two priority was to build a new Carver Middle School. The third priority was to build a new Tennyson Middle School. The fourth priority was to combine Alta Vista and Kendrick and give them a new elementary and then to do upgrades to South Waco Elementary. So those are the five projects that are on the bond. As far as uh, I'll just kind of follow up with uh, Trustee Guillory said, the reason why I voted for the bond is I've seen in action uh, the upgrades that needed to happen to these campuses. Uh, as a former WISD employee, I just stopped working for the district in February. So I was at Carver. <laughs> I didn't know, you know, he was talking about taking a tour. I was touring every day. And before I worked at Carver, I worked at Tennyson. And before I worked at Tennyson, I was a sub across the district. So I had already seen a lot of these facilities firsthand and kind of the challenges that they were faced. So I think um, looking at the, the tax rates that are coming right now and just how low the inflation rate is, I thought it was a good, a good move. So as far as the numbers, so the bond is 355 million total. Uh, that for the average homeowner, that'll look about like $117 a year. And that'll be about $10 a month. So I think it's important to also point out that if you're 65 years or older, you have a tax freeze. So your taxes will not be affected for our senior citizens. So, um, and I want to point out that uh, because of Carver, you know, that bond, that bond price went down a little bit and we got a little, uh, a little, knock down on our uh, tax rate for the district in general. So we have a lot of, it's a, it's a, the stars are aligning for us to do these projects. So that's why we decided to uh, push the bond forward. Um, I can't advocate for or against the bond at this point, but what I can tell you is to please look at the facts. Um, if you need the facts, please ask for them. We don't mind sharing them for you, but that's, that's why we came to this point and that's how we made that decision. Um, like I said, yearly it'll look like around $117. That's about $9.80 a month uh, for the average homeowner or, you know, so if you guys have any questions on, on the bonds or the tax impact. Oh, come on now. <laughs> well, while everyone thinks, I'm gonna go through the, um, the handout. Hopefully everyone um, got one on the way in. Just to show you the, the footprint, I always like, I wanna show the vision and, and the dream uh, for the new Carver is we, we're talking about a bigger, uh, more beautiful um, school for our students. And, and when, we, when our students walk through the halls or when they, um, <laughs> when, they get off that, when they get off that bus the first day they walk up to the new school, I, I want to be there and see their faces. Um, I know my old high school, James Madison in Houston, was, um, it was rebuilt. It was a lot like um, the old Waco High. And I went there, I took my kids with me just this past, um, this, this summer. Uh, I always talk about my old high school years, like a lot, of, a, lot of guys, a lot of guys, and you know, what I did on the football field and what I did in the classroom. And I brought my, 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 my kids with me to go see um, my old school. And to my surprise, when I pulled up to it, I almost passed it up. It was a brand new, um, beautiful um, two-story school. And it was, it was, it was amazing. And that put everything in perspective for me. I was like, man, this is, this is what our city needs. This is what our, our, our city school needs. This is what Waco needs. It needs a new uh, Waco High School. And so if you look at um, the first page, we're talking about a, a um, consolidating Carver in Indian Springs and building a new Tennyson. And so the new Carver um, campus uh, will be 184,000 square feet. And it will house, um, be able to, the capacity there will be um, for 1,060 uh, middle school students. And it will be constructed on the existing Carver campus, is which um, I believe I've heard um, everyone in this neighborhood say that they want it, and that's what we want. Uh, the new um, Tennyson uh, Middle School will be also 184,000 square feet, and it will also be able to um, house 1,060. Uh, middle school students. And, and again, uh, we always hear these hot topic words. We always hear people use the word equity. And so what you will see across our city, you will see Tennyson Middle School and you will see the new Carver Middle School. Um, they will be competitive with each other. One won't be greater than the other. You will see true um, equity right there. 
And the total project cost um, for those two would be $150 um, million. And so the two um, phases of construction, they say, which should take um, between 15 and 18 months. If you look at the, the second page, these are comparative schools on, on what we look, this is what we're looking at when we're talking about a new carver. And I talk about those study spaces. You look in your upper left-hand corner. Those are students that are, be, they are able to collaborate in private spaces and be able to dream and talk and, and do projects and, 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 and host um, student meetings and, and things like that. And so you look at the, at the top right-hand corner, that's a library. And I don't know the last time you stepped in Carver Library, but it, it didn't look anything like that. And that, um, that's a middle school, and our Waco High Library doesn't look like that. And so you still look down to the, um, to the bottom left-hand corner, you're seeing more space. Um, you, you see uh, mock classrooms, and you see students able to sit, um, sit down and, and have discussions and talk to their teachers, and, and administrators able to pass by and see inside the rooms and, and communicate with the students. And these are the things that we're thinking and dreaming about, and this is what we want to build in our community. And so you look at the um, bottom right-hand corner, and I can't tell you what kind of space that is, but it looks amazing. <laughs> but I, I do still see um, students there um, sitting on the steps and, and able to communicate with each other. I think about our drill team over at Wake, Ohio, who I just saw um, at, the, at our family fest and able to sit there and talk and, and, and collaborate and, and able to bounce things off of each other. You look at the students and it look like they're over there to the right um, on computers and that's the technology we're talking about. Look at that well-lit school with that, um, I'm gonna talk like um, Joanne Gaines with all the natural lighting. Uh, coming from <laughs> from the top, and, and our students are able to walk through halls, walk through the hallways, and be proud of the schools that they're walking in, and that to me means everything, and that's confidence, that students being able to uh, be proud of where they're from. You know, I understand the historical um, the historical meaning behind the old Carver, but one thing I was able to to be happy about and to be able to to directly go to when I was looking at that school burn was a, um, we were already looking to build a new school for our community, a big, beautiful school. And I think this right here, um, passing the bond, was steps in the right direction um, for healing uh, for our community. And I look forward um, to breaking ground. I, I look forward to the ribbon cutting. I look forward to our students being able to walk into um, new schools in our city. So as far as like timelines, so we've already, we, we approved last week for them to go ahead and start the design process for Carver. So we're trying to show that we are super committed to the Carver project being done. Um, I think it's important to, for our community to realize that we're, we were already planning to build a bigger and better Carver. So this school that is going to uh, be built will be vastly um, bigger and more updated than the Carver that was there previously. So that's kind of uh, some of the reasons for the pricing, because I know that's been a big uh, topic about, you know, insurance and the fire. So, yes, ma'am. Yeah, so um, actually we, a couple months ago, we just were blessed with the ESSER funds. So the ESSER funds is basically a stimulus check that the district gets. So we're putting about almost $40 million into education. So everything from intervention, interventionists to help kids with pull out and reading interventionists from uh, new laptops, uh, new uh, technology in the hallways and in the classrooms. We're updating every library in the district. So the educational, uh, aspect of kind of the upgrades had already been taken care of before the bond. So it was almost uh, nothing left to do after that part but to build a new school because we would have the updated uh, technology, we would have the updated libraries, we would have the staff that we need to help our kids more on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So it was kind of like the buildings was the last thing we needed to fully provide an equitable environment for our kids. 
and speaking, I'm gonna, I wanna finish on, on, on the question here. And so we're looking at 73, let me see here, we're looking at um, $73 million to design, build, furnish, and equip the campus. And what you, what some of the highlights that I did right down here, I say it'd be larger classroom sizes and larger common spaces. Uh, you have um, more flexible spaces that can, that can be used for academic intervention and student collaboration like we've been talking about. Um, more transparency, more windows, um, more, glass, more glass providing visibility in the hallways and lighting, talked about that. And it also would, would include um, modern security measures um, for these new schools. If you look at um, the old Carver, one of the things that's really close to my heart too is also bringing buildings up to code and making sure we have um, the, the, the working sprinkler systems, making sure we have working um, fire alarm systems and security systems and making a more secure and safer campus for our students. Um, we're talking about um, less, less um, exits and entrances into the buildings, um, wasted exits and entrances into the buildings, making our students not, not safe in a, in, a, in a time where we have, um, unfortunately, we have school shootings that we have to prepare for. And so looking at that and also, again, the, the modern technology um, that would be integrated throughout the campus. Um, it would be a, a beautiful campus to walk through. Again, looking forward to it. And a bigger school to provide more space for fine arts, Spanish, more, uh, more personalized programming going on in the schools. That's definitely right. Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's a that's a yeah. 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 I agree with you. My my son and I we practice many days over on tennis and football field. And you can see on the front page, um, on the handout, you'll see where they're where they're going to where they're um, attending to position the, the track and field and yeah. And, I, and as, as the as the design, so the design will be made to have a better uh, access from the community because I know in the past the track and field and the and the everything was behind the school so it was hard to access but in the new design as you can see the field and the track will have better access to the community and we're moving and working with the uh, city of Waco to make sure we're providing access to the community on our campuses to use those services. So yeah, it's coming. It's coming for sure. It'll be there. Yes, sir.
<laughs> yeah, but to, to Mr. Jeffers' point, um, this, is, this is the reason why we do these, um, to bring out questions and information like that. And that is a request from the community, and that we're going to look at Look at that. Um, let's talk to Mr. Um, Coach Love about that. He's over. Right. <laughs> no, I'm So they do have an option to go to another middle school. So they would have to put in a transfer. So that the transfer could be denied, but you do have the option to put in a transfer. You will have transportation for the kids that go to Carver that will be at Indian Springs this year. We will have buses to transport those kids back and forth as needed. As far as the timelines, so Carver, the planning will start next month, and then the whole school should be done by 2023. Summer 2023. Uh, the school should be built in fall 2023. Students should be walking in the door. Now that's if the bond passes in November. That's the timeline. As far as Waco High, Waco High finished in 2025. Uh, South Waco will finish in 2024 as well as Tennyson. And then Kendrick will finish in 2025 as well. But as far as right now, if we with our timeline, Carver should finish first and that'll be in 2023. And then that's when all the kids from Carver and Indian Springs will be at the new Carver building. Any other questions? All right. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that, that everyone had an opportunity to talk about a lot of, because there's a lot of moving parts going on right now. Um, with what the bond is, to what, is it, what does the vote mean? And so you wanted to have an opportunity to speak with the people who can answer those questions. And we are so grateful to have Trustee Davis and Trustee Guillory um, on the panel, the uh, support of Trustee Cordewig in the audience and a lot of our, our, our community leaders and, and city staff. Um, so regarding District 1, um, we've, We've, we're, we're making some changes and doing some things. And I wanted to make sure if there were any questions about the recent acquisition of, uh, or, per, or the beginning the process of purchasing the Doris Miller Y, that we were here to open and answer those questions for you. Um, I am incredibly excited about the potential opportunity that are coming in our, our, our communities. Um, I'm super excited, I'm, I see Mr. Jefferson, I'm super excited about um, the, Bledsoe, the Bledsoe Miller. Um, so when I got elected in 18, I realized that the Bledsoe was one of the, was the last community center that hadn't been updated. And I had, you know, there was a problem with that. Um, you know, it had been rumored around the community, well, you know, we're going to, they're going to do this with it or they're going to do that with it. And, you know, I don't do, I don't speak they well. So, you know, we got to looking at it and what did it mean to upgrade it and advance it? Well, I, I, I went to a facility that was um, in Dallas that was a teen tech center. And I said, so how couldn't, what, we could have one of those. I mean, it was sponsored by Best Buy. They had 3D printers. They had all kind of robotics and coding and, you know, the latest computers and all of those things. And I said, well, we could, we could have that. And so we started talking about what, what, um, what having a facility that was dedicated to STEM looked like. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, in, in good conscience, I couldn't have anything that was named after Jules Bledsoe not have arts involved. So we decided to uh, shift and make it a STEAM academy. It's not a school. It has no intention to be. We have wonderful schools in our district. There is no need to make another one. Uh, but what it could do is being an additional resource for our schools, for our students. Um, technology is the future, we all know that. If we're talking about how we advance buildings and build buildings to 
be able to sustain. I mean, I was complaining about the Wi-Fi in this building today. There's no reason in 2021 that we can't have <laughs> adequate Wi-Fi and do the thing. I know I'm just making all the staff crazy right now. But um, it's what we need. And so what we do is better. So we had the opportunity to find a way to turn that facility into a steam center. So it, the Doris Miller wasn't all, even on the table at the point we started having that conversation. We were just gonna have to figure out where the community center part was, if that meant we built another one, um, if that, whatever it meant, because it wasn't like we were taking anything away from the community. As a matter of fact, you know, our whole goal is to add, you know, make easier, make more convenient, add additional resources, make better pathways. Because I think that today, if one of the arguments that I've always heard from the time I was little to the time yes, I walked in this building, that you know, there's not enough for our children to do. Well, let's make it more for them to do. Let's find a pathway. And I think in that STEAM center and you're talking about, I mean, there is, the sky's the limit because right now in Waco, Texas, you have SpaceX, you got Allegan, L3 Harris, um, Eminem Mars, it pick, pick an industry, Amazon, that are right here. And so now, you know, we have, there's multiple facets of technology. I mean, we've got TSTC doing aero, you know, uh, uh, aviation stuff. You, they've got the Challenge Center out over there that were, is partnering with NASA. We've already got the pieces to the puzzle. Let's get them all in the same box and how we work together to do that. And we find pathways for our children, so that way if they're interested in robotics, that way if they're interested in engineering, that way if they're interested in biology, we need some more Dr. Reynolds, and so we've got to find a pathway to do that. You know, we, children can only be what they see. So if we put it in front of them, then that means that we have an opportunity to do more. Um, and that's kind of what the STEAM Center will do. I think that, you know, I'm, I'm very pleased to see my minister, uh, Dr. Hunter here, but he is a brilliant musician, right? And so here's the thing, because again, we got that A in there. I think what happens if you do sound engineering in the STEAM Center? You know, what does it look like if somebody, I don't know if, if anybody knew anybody who was in the recording industry built a studio? Mm. I mean, I don't know. Mm. I mean, on this table, I think, you know, probably three of us at this table know people who are in the recording industry and can do that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, but in order for you to be able to record, you've got to volunteer or you've got to do so many classes in the STEAM Center. You've got to do so many things. You've got to pay it forward. There's not a cost for you to record because, I mean, you don't know. I don't know who the next whatever is. Mm. But the fact that the possibility is there, that's what we're looking for. And that's what we're looking to do. So my challenge right now is to keep myself in, in my own bubble and not just break out of my skin because I'm excited about getting it done. Uh, but gathering the partnerships, which we've already begun. We started talking with Waco ISD. We started talking with LaVega ISD so we can show them what the possibilities are for our students going forward. These are after school programs. These are spring break academies. These are summer schools. These are mid winter break uh, sessions. That's what this is. These are, uh, Field trips, that's what this is. You know, but you'll have that right here along the Brazos in the beautiful Bledsoe Miller Steam Center. No names are changing. And, you know, with the sale of the Doris Miller Y, we had an opportunity, we saw an opportunity to keep a, um, an anchor institution within our community. We saw an opportunity to not let chance go. Because, you know, the wise all across the country have had to shift in their financial model. You know, it's not just this one. And so, you know, our, the Y, the members of the Y, the board of the Y, leadership of the Y decided the best thing to do would be to merge with Williamson County and sell some of their assets. You know, City of Waco had an opportunity to step in and say, hey, if, if we do that, which we're not done yet, we haven't closed. Okay, we don't close till mid-September-ish. Um, but we had an opportunity to keep um, a community facility that is known for keeping our bodies safe, you know, as known for a place where community can gather, play ball, do whatever, with an additional eight acres that we can do some more stuff and more activities. I'm looking forward to what that lacrosse team, a cricket team, looks like in the middle of mm. Paul Quinn campus 
along with football and baseball and <laughs> all the things. Um, you know, what if, I, you know, we don't know and there's too many things uh, about what is inside of what will happen programmatically, but to know that we're not moving or taking away any of the things that this community has known. But we do have the opportunity to add. And we do have the opportunity to better and deepen and you know, create just more memories and space uh, for our young people, for our old people. Shoot, I told them, I said, look, mess around and have some water aerobics class, see if I'm not in there. <laughs> These bad knees will get to working. But that's what we have the opportunity to do. And so I think that, that, I mean, there's so many things. We've got the, you know, uh, what is this, uh, the sidewalks program. Let me get the name right. Safe routes to school, right? Um, that's going on right now. It is so inconvenient, all the construction. But it'll be so much better that there'll be a safe sidewalk for our babies to walk on. And I don't, I, it, it, yes, I'm inconvenienced for a little while, but they'll be safe for a lifetime. And I'm okay with that. Um, you know, we, we can't complain about change when we demand it at the same voice. And we, in order for it to get better, we got, you know, we got to break it up. <laughs> we got to break it up in, to, in order to fix it. And I think that's what we're doing. Um, we are, this is the first, and I'm giving y'all the fast forward version because we, we've already 12 minutes <laughs> over what we have had agreed to keep you to. And I want to make sure you have an opportunity to ask any questions of me for the city. But, um, you know, we, we are doing a lot. We're in the middle of budget season, so I, I encourage you tomorrow, uh, starting at 2 o'clock with the work session, 6 o'clock for the business session. If you have questions about city council, join us. Join us or watch it on the, on the show. Give me a call. Send me an email if you've got questions about what are happening. We're in the middle of the budget. We've got a whole bunch of pots, a whole bunch of buckets for um, the American Rescue Plan money. We're going to see what happens with the infrastructure money. But at the end of the day, with your tax dollars, we are doing the work that you have asked us to do. The one, and never mind ARP, never mind infrastructure, because you know some of it, that's that's plus, <laughs> that's that's cherry. With the you know, this is the first time we've not had a we've lowered the tax rate since 2014. We're we're getting that we did that this year, even with COVID. Waco was one of the first cities to recover to uh, pre-COVID sales tax numbers in the state. You know, I don't know how we did it, but we did it, and we did it with you. Um, and we're going to continue to do it because we're going to better our future. We're going to take care of each other now. Cue the mask. Um, you know, and do all those things to keep going and carry on. So uh, I know Mr. Jefferson has a question because I love Mr. Jefferson. Mr. Jefferson always had questions. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what we going well so the, there's two right I, I know I know um, and that's one of the things that we're talking about so the truth is I don't know because there are two pools there's one that's outside that we don't know what kind of damage is sustained in the freeze we just don't know the one that's inside I mean there's a pool inside. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be hopeful, but I cannot promise. But I'm going to be hopeful. And I said, I said, if, it, you know, if we're going to be, I'm going to be in there with the water robes class with the senior minister. I already said. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And I, I did, I passed your note that you sent on to staff because we, and I appreciate you reaching out to us because everybody doesn't say that. And Alton Jefferson did say that. He, he called me to tell me what, what was wrong. He called me to also tell me when it got fixed. And we appreciate you for that. <laughs> <laughs> of course, absolutely. What, anybody else? Anybody? We're so grateful for you all for coming and joining and, 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 and taking time out to hear and let us hear from you, you know, and I'm, I'm, I will certainly allow Trustee D Giller and Trustee Davis to, to make their uh, closing statements. But, you know, as, as the representative for District 1, we are, 
we're ready and we're you know past due for some things and it's our responsibility to push it through and walk it through but we can't do it without one another and so i'm grateful for you and i'm grateful for your voices and your your voices that you speak with but your ears that you hear with but the vision that you cast and i'm thankful for you I want to thank uh, Dr. Reynolds. Thank you for coming out today and, and sharing all that great information. And also thank um, Dr. Houston um, for us as well. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great time here in Waco. It's a, it's a beautiful day here in Waco. And we see all these new um, these schools and, and uh, STEAM centers and, and you know, the, taking over the YMCA for the city and, and making these um, amazing opportunities for our young people uh, to get plugged into different programs. And you've heard us talk over the summer about making sure that our young people um, have places to go and, and study and, and, and get signed up for different types of um, sports and, and activities and things like that to keep our, our young people out of the streets and, and put them into places where they can, where they can, they can, they can engage um, each other in a different way and, and learn and grow. And so that's why we're here today to, to talk about um, all these new great things that's going on in our city. And I'm excited and hope you're excited. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good day to be awake on. I'll just end it by saying, you know, thank you guys for coming out. Uh, it's very important. Uh, one of the things that was near and dear to my heart as when I got sworn into the board was making sure we have settings like this to talk to the community, to hear back from the community, and take it to the board to do what we need to do. So uh, like uh, Councilwoman Barefield said, we hit the ground running as soon as we, we were sworn in on the 13th. Uh, we got hit with a lot, but I think we've been doing good. And uh, I definitely will just encourage the community to keep showing up. Please keep calling. Please keep giving your questions. Uh, <clears throat> and also, on the 22nd of August, that's um, Sunday at 5 at, the, at Oscar Duke and J Park, right next to Carver Middle School, we will have a prayer visual. So we ask that you guys come out and join us, just praying for our kids, that they have a safe and successful year. Um, and all of our kids across the district and across the country to have a safe and successful year. Uh, just know I'm always here to answer any questions or, or uh, anything you might need. You can reach out, and I just appreciate you guys for coming out tonight. <laughs>